And now we have Lina Sebadjos who will talk about EU policy topics uh, we should all know about. So hello everyone. Um, yeah, so I think I would like to start um, my presentation sharing a little bit of a personal experience. Um, so when people ask me how I end up in the free software community, I always go back to the actually root the main reason why I came across some of the free software solutions and um, it goes back some years ago when I actually started to care about my privacy and my personal data that um, I actively started to look for options and that's how I end up getting to know some of the free software solutions. Uh, but Ironically enough, it was only until I was part of the free software community that I realized all the other aspects in which technology can affect our lives and the important role that free software plays here. And apart from that, I also realized how technology is shaped by different actors. One of them, you guys, who have the skills and the knowledge to actually create the technology, but also by decision makers uh, or policy makers who actually have the power but also the responsibility to set up the guidelines or the frameworks under which this technology will be regulated or not. And that's how I became passionate about kind of being a bridge between these two actors um, so they can actually communicate with one another and they can actually understand each other. And that is the reason why I'm here today to talk about policy topics, some of them of course, uh, with you, uh, as the same way I do when I address decision makers and I talk about free software with them. So, first, let me introduce myself at the organization that I work for or that I belong to. So I'm Lina Ceballos and I am Policy Project Manager at the Free Software Foundation Europe. Uh, we are a charity that empowers users to control technology and we do this with the help and the promotion of free software. We are a uh, small team of staffers but we're a big team of volunteers and uh, supporters so this is just a part of the people who is behind the FSFE and yeah so I have the pleasure to come here to talk a little bit about what we do at least from the policy side. So um, I also like to start my presentations by going back to the basics and putting pretty much everybody on the same page. And I really like yesterday's Jeffrey's keynote as well because he also mentioned these four freedoms. And I think it is always important to talk about them because at least personally I feel that nowadays uh, some of these freedoms are being undermined or they're not being considered as important. So again, whenever we talk about free software, we're talking about four freedoms the freedom to use, to study, to share, and to improve the software. And whenever there is a freedom that is lacking for this four, then we're not talking about free software anymore. So, um, yeah, I think in order to understand a little bit better uh, our work, at least on the policy side, we have to talk about our campaign, which I would say is quite well known or public money, public code campaign. So this is a campaign that started more than five years ago. Um, and 
it is a campaign under a framework that we use to support a lot of our, our arguments. And whenever we approach in decision makers, we always bring back these arguments and the reasons why public, the public sector should release their code as public. Um, so basically this campaign is requiring that all the publicly funded software that is developed by the public sector should be available under a free software license. And yeah, I know we are very familiar with the um, arguments behind uh, this demand and the reasons why this is important, so you know, to enhance transparency uh, due to the openness of the code, but also to reduce costs or better to say to share costs and also to um, encourage collaboration with among um, public administrations so there is no need to, you know, start from zero or develop something from scratch if there is something already out there that can be reused. And uh, last but not least, of course, to avoid uh, the vendor lock-in, which I think is uh, still quite a big problem nowadays, not only in Europe, but I think around the world. Um, yeah, that mainly a lot, like a lot of public administrations are trapped in, in some sort of uh, vendor lock-in. Um, and I mean, of course, with this, then we also selling, saying that this is a way for the public to get something back because you know that the public money is being spent in the most efficient way and there is not a waste of public money in licenses that are not needed if there is something out there. Um, and yeah, so with the regard to this, organ this uh, campaign, we actively reach out to administrations and we have an open letter that you can check here on our publiccode.eu website. You can sign as individuals, organizations, but also as public administrations. Um, and yeah, today I wanted to briefly talk or show you that we have seven administrations, some of them from Spain, Germany, Sweden, uh, and recently one from Luxembourg. So, yeah, this is, um, this is nice, but we also like to think that it is also nice that the administrations actually do something, even if they don't put the logo on our website, if they are committed to release their code under a free software license, then that's also a win. But, yeah. So, um, to talk a little bit about, I mean, the policy work, um, the legislative process is uh, carried by the three institutions, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the Council, because of reasons and also because of time. I'm not gonna talk about the Council today, and I'm gonna mainly talk about the European Commission and the European Parliament. So, um, let's start with the European Commission. So the European Commission is the body or the institution that has, that has a um, legislative initiative. So it's the, the institution that can actually propose things. But today I want to look at the Commission more um, from the perspective of their use of uh, free software. Because over the last years we have seen that the European Commission has been somehow committed to use free software. Um, and they, it has kind of created some sort of guidelines to uh, yeah, set up the, the terms under which they're gonna release or share this code. So I think in order to understand better, or, less, or just to go a little bit back in time, so we have to talk about the um, EU FOSA and the EU FOSA 2. These were um, some programs that were actually given by the European Parliament to the European Commission in order to kind of uh, audit or find vulnerabilities of the open source solutions that have been or that are being used in the EU institutions. So basically, 
what they did um, was one sec. Um, yeah, so basically what they did was that uh, they created some kind of activities to audit some of this software that is, it was being used. Um, this run, these two projects run for around six years, from 2014 to 2020. Uh, they did some things, they um, did some bug bounties and, and some hackathons and yeah, somehow they they helped improve uh, the security of the open source solutions that are being used in the EU institutions. However, they stopped. Um, and I think along my talk, you're going to hear me say this over and over again, but this is one of the main reasons or the main problems that we find and is the lack of budget. Um, so there was not really a dedicated budget alloc uh, allocated for this program. And that's one of also the reasons why these activities had to stop. So, yeah, they just kind of uh, improved some of these solutions for a while and then it uh, stopped. They stopped completely. But then, in 2020, after the first open source strategy from the Commission um, expired, so to say, in 2017, then the Commission released the open source strategy. And this strategy is not a law, so it's not legally binding, so it's just a communication. So yeah, it's a communication from the Commission to the Commission. We don't know <laughs> what that actually means, uh, but yeah, so in this text, we, I mean, we welcome that the European Commission actually acknowledge the role that open source plays in their digital infrastructure. But it is rather like a quick, weak, and ambitious, uh, and ambiguous text to be a strategy of its own. Uh, and like, for instance, here the activities of like FOSA two were mentioned, but there was not any reference uh, about why these projects haven't been continued or any concrete projects that will go after this. So what we think here is that the European Commission could actually had, have the chance to go in the direction of free software first, you know, to make it the default or the standard way to share. So if you're using open source, then let's just keeping open, open uh, for everybody. But what they did was that they, with their very ambiguous wording, uh, such as like, whatever it makes sense to do so, they will share the source code. And we find this a little bit problematic because, I mean, wh when or where does it make sense? And actually, for who does it make sense, right? So if a text comes with this kind of wording that it's problematic by itself. And then there is also some wording, like the one here, that uh, when there are good reasons to do so, the Commission will choose non-open technologies. So again, good reasons for who and what are actually good reasons to not use open source. So this is not clear, and this like really leaves uh, a lot of um, ambiguity for those who read it, and also for them who are actually implementing somehow this kind of framework. Um, but then, one year later, into 20, in 2021, then they took a step forward, and what it was a project was kind of like a guideline became a legally binding paper with this decision. Um, and basically this decision uh, wanted to kind of define the conditions uh, for the commission to share their uh, open source to facilitate the reuse and sharing of their uh, software. And this decision actually introduced some 
some things, such as the European Commission Open Source Program Office, which uh, acts as a facilitator for all the activities that out, are outlined in this decision. And they also uh, created a public repository. So now the European Commission has a public repository where they are meant to share the free software solutions they use. I also have to say that I took a look at this repository some days ago and it's quite inactive and it doesn't have many things there. But again, we still like to, you know, at least highlight the will and the initiative that the Commission is taking, at least to share the, um, the software they use. But again, there is not budget here. So we are just afraid that this decision will just end up being another uh, ambiguous document from the Commission and that a lot of the activities that are supposed to be um, carried by the Commission are not because of the lack of budget as well. Um, so yeah, I mean this is more or less how the open source um, um, landscape looks in the European Commission. And now I want to talk a little bit about the European Parliament. So I'm going to talk about, I know that maybe you are very familiar, at the moment there is a lot of things happening in the digital policies and of course because of time and I think each of these topics are like a talk of 45 or even one hour so I'm going to really give a very brief um, overview of the topics that happened some months ago and that are still uh, happening at the moment. So first of all, um, so we have, first we have an AI a resolution which is not a legally binding document and which is complete at the moment um, and this was carried out by a committee that was specifically created to do this resolution. And this resolution is supposed to serve as a guideline for the AI Act, which is ongoing and which is happening and which it seems like finally is moving a little bit forward since yesterday there was a, co a vote in the leading committees. But yeah, I, I will briefly talk about uh, this soon. Um, then we also have a declaration of digital rights and principles that uh, we actively work on it. The outcome was not the best one, and I will also briefly talk about this. We have the Cyber Resilience Act that I bet you guys are very, or you have heard of it, which is also ongoing. Uh, we also have the Product Liability Directive, which is also at the moment uh, being discussed in the Parliament, and the Interoperable Europe Act. So there is quite a lot of things that um, are keeping busy the MEPs at the moment. Uh, so the three ones that you see in green are mainly about liability and free software, and the reasons why we step in was because it could have an impact on the free software community, but it, it is mainly related to liability and responsibility of free software. So, sorry. So, because of, um, as I said, because of time, I'm just going to talk about these three. Um, but I mean, I'm going to be around here, uh, and you can also reach me out via email, and I will be more than happy to exchange some insights or thoughts in other files if you're interested. On, and I will be also very happy to hear your thoughts on some of them, or the ones that I'm not going to be talking about today. So, let's start with the AI resolution. As I mentioned, um, this, was a, this was handled by a committee, by the AIDA committee, which was created specifically to do this. So it was a committee to kind of give an overview to the European Parliament on how to move forward with the AI Act. And as I mentioned in the beginning, 
we usually use our PMPC or public money, public code arguments to advocate for free software. So we did that and during the whole negotiation we engaged with decision makers and we managed to bring something on the direction of public procurement and AI. So there is an part that says that public procurement uh, should where appropriate mandate uh, the use of open source technologies when it comes to AI solutions. However, here we have, um, and this is something like really that repeats itself all the time, and it's the wording, so again, we're appropriate. So it's similar to the uh, wording from the commission documents, when it makes sense, when there are good reasons, where it's appropriate, where, yeah. And until now we have seen that they actually use this wording to sometimes not choose open source or not release the, pub the code as public. However, after, some, after a lot of um, discussion on the European Parliament, then this passed, this is included in the final text. Again, this is not a legal, legally binding document, so there is nothing we can um, kind of reinforce here. But the positive side was that this specific part uh, was voted in plenary and it, it found a, a huge majority. So I think this also shows us that the European Parliament is starting to slowly realize, realizing that free software, or like the, the reality of the free software ecosystem. So this was something, this was um, something that shows us or showed us uh, that, uh, but yeah. Now with the AI Act, the discussion is going on a little bit of a completely direction. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned yesterday, there was a vote in the lead committees and the European Parliament, also by a huge majority, uh, want to recognize that it's uh, something different or that is a particularity that the free software ecosystem has. Um, if you want to read more about this, we had a press release from yesterday also on our website. So um, feel free to go to our website, fsfe.org, and then read more about it. Um, and again, I will be more than happy to exchange some insights after this. Um, yeah, so after that then, the Declaration of Digital Rights and Principles came, the proposal, and we, decide, we decided to step in because uh, this declaration will serve as a reference point to the ongoing digital transformation of Europe. So this is, um, I mean, this might not be the most important document, but it's a guideline, and guidelines such as, for instance, the Tallinn Declaration or the Berlin Declarations, which are more member states' commitments, are very useful for us whenever we are addressing decision makers. Because there is quite a lot of the, the like promotion of free software for the public sector or the procurement of free and open source software out there, so we decided to step in and to try to include the wording of free software in a better way on this declaration. So there was, um, or there is a part on AI as well, and then we try to include uh, the importance of free software there, or that at least free software was mentioned in the document or in the text. Um, and we managed to pass um, or to find a majority in the European Parliament with this text, but as you might also know, after the European Parliament finds its, uh, its position, then the European Commission, the Council and the Parliament have the inter interinstitutional uh, negotiations. And unfortunately, this fell short into its ambitions within this period. So the text that we had in the European, from the European Parliament was changed in the end. And now we have something kind of like making a references to promoting interoperability, open technologies, and standards. Um, and this is still pretty ambiguous to our 
perspective. I mean, the, 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 the wording that it was before in the European from the European Parliament position was, were, was way more clear and it actually made a reference to open source technologies. But yeah, now this is gone. Um, and I mean, I wanted to talk a little bit about this one because it actually shows, again, that the European Parliament is, is, is slowly, slowly, slowly um, getting to understand a little bit the free software um, ecosystem. Uh, but they're not the only ones who are actually defining how the text should look like in the end. So I also personally have to say that um, the uh, legislative process in Europe is pretty, pretty open. It's one of the most transparent and open, actually, that I've seen, at least when it comes to the European Parliament. The Council and the Commission are a little bit more closed, and that's why we always try to step in uh, during the discussions in the European Parliament, because it's the most transparent one, and it's the, actually the one that we have seen uh, to have not only the will, but actually the, the openness to, to bring up our demands. And um, yeah, the last one that I wanted to talk about and uh, the one that I actually wanted to focus on today is the Interoperable Europe Act. So this is a proposal from the Commission from I think November last year. So it's quite uh, recent and it's been discussed in the European Parliament right now. And basically what they want to do is um, have a cross-border regulation that it will help EU and member states, uh, public administrations of course, to deliver digital public services. So, I mean, this is not something new. There is already a framework on interoperability, but there is not a regulation for such um, efforts. So again, we decided to step in on this file as well because this is actually the file where we can bring up a lot of our demands, not only on PMPC, but actually bring in uh, the importance, the real importance that free software can play for interoperability. So, um, I mean, maybe you are very familiar, but I always like to uh, bring everybody on the same page. So interoperability is, you know, the ability for information systems to speak with one another. So basically, if you take your car here from Croatia and then you're driving to Austria and then you need to park your car, you need to register for the parking place, then you have to give your uh, number plate or number license from the car. and if there is not interoperability, then probably you won't be able to register your plate there because they cannot take Croatian uh, license, car licenses, and then you won't be able to park your car, let's say. So it's this kind of, um, you know, digital public services. And this is just a small example, it can go from health to education to pretty much a lot of of these digital public services and if it is true that this act is meant for public administrations but I mean in the end public administrations are there to serve the public and to provide these services to the public um, yeah and that's why it is important that uh, free software is acknowledged here so the proposal already comes with the knowledge of open source and open standards um, as an important, uh, like as to have an important role uh, for interoperability. Um, and so I want to, yeah, briefly talk about what is um, what wants to be included with this act. There are also some other things such as trainings or peer reviews or even sandboxes, but I, I, I just figured that I would talk about the ones that I think have an impact for the free software community. 
So the first one uh, is that they want to implement a governance uh, structure. So basically, they want to create these two new bodies. The one that would be called Interoperable Europe Board and the Interoperable Europe Community. And they're supposed to interact with one another. But then when you take a closer look at the text, then you see that the board will have a lot of power because they will, it will be the one who is actually making the decisions, who is actually setting up the agenda and just setting up the priorities. And this will be done every year. So until now, part of the board are one representative of each member state, the European Commission, the Committee of the Regions, and uh, the European Economic and Social Committee. So, yeah, we believe that there should be a bigger involvement from, the, from civil society, specifically from the free software community. Um, but yeah, I, I will talk about first what's new and then I will complain. <laughs> so um, then they, they also want to implement a mandatory chair and reuse approach. So basically they want to make the default, the chair and reuse, but in the text, the way it is now, it says that when it's requested, so it doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you wanna make sharing and reuse the standard, why do you even have to request it? Um, and then there is also something on interoperable um, assessments. So here then public administrations will have to see if they can reuse something that is already there or if they need to procure something new. And if this new solution is actually interoperable. And they also want to implement some kind of portal. So where it would be kind of like a, a single point, point entry for all the public administrations where they share all the solutions and where the agenda will be also shared and yeah, pretty much you will find all this information in this portal. Um, so yeah, coming back to the governance structure, then um, one of our main demands at the moment is that the European, uh, the free software community should be part of this board. Um, and we believe that it is important for the community to be part of it because, as I mentioned, is the, the actually the, govern, the governing body, the one that has the power to make decisions. Um, and while engaging with uh, decision makers, we have also came to the conclusion that basically our red line would be to be an observer. Because again, if we are an observer here, then we'll still have the transparency and the access to all this information, all these decisions, and in a way we can still influence um, the agenda and push for our, um, for our demands and our uh, priorities. Apart from this, um, then we also find that there is not really indicators or clear objectives within this act and we believe that if this is not clear then it's really difficult to monitor the progress of the whole um, yeah, activity. So if you don't know what you're measuring, how do you even gonna measure the progress? So we're also pushing to include some way, like somehow indicators that actually help us to measure if there is progress or not. Once again, there is a lack of budget. Um, and yeah, it is true that this is not a funding program. But we're talking about uh, putting some sort of burden in some administrations in the local regional level. And it should be mentioned where, this, where the money is coming from, at least. So we're also pushing to make it more clear in this regard to at least make a mention from where the money will come. Um, we also believe that this is actually the right file where we can bring the definition of free software or open source. Because at the moment, we have seen this discussion a lot. So we have seen the European Parliament trying to define what free software means. And of course, everybody has their, their own 
definition and their own version and then we believe that if we manage to bring a definition of free software into this document then this discussion won't be um, needed anymore. Um, and there is also one last point regarding a cross-border uh, procurement. We know that public procurement is a national affair, but within this file, um, I think it would be actually very helpful to set up a guideline or to provide guidance and support for member states to establish a cross-border um, common and harmonized public procurement for open source. Because, I mean, it doesn't make any sense for us to talk about public administration talking with one another if public procurement in member states keeps taking place the same way as it is taking place at the moment. So we need to actually go back to the root, to the main problem, which is that it is very difficult for a lot of free software projects to participate in pr the procurement processes, or that it's even, like, even impossible because public administrations are already locked with a vendor. So in this document, there should be a way to, or at least a guideline to help member states and public administrations to create more like a cross-border and harmonized way to uh, procure free software. And that's why we believe that this is exactly the place where um, there, should, there should be a free software first approach. So if we're going to talk about sharing and reuse by default, then let's talk about free software first. Uh, and then if you cannot really, or you, it's really difficult for you to uh, release your code, then you should explain why, and not the other way around. So we believe that um, this is the opportunity that the EU has to change a little bit this, or go into a very different path. Uh, but yeah, again, let's see how that goes. Uh, this is something that is being discussed right now. Um, and that will take some months as well. So, to uh, very briefly uh, wrap up my, my talk, then uh, there are so many ways you guys, the community, can help us. So, it, within our public money, public code framework, we have a, a lot of material, we have a very nice brochure where we have a nice uh, good practices in Europe um, and then you can also approach your local administration and talk about free software. Maybe some of you already have done it. And here I, I always like to make a friendly reminder that, you know, public administrations, yes, it's the, the parliaments, the ministers, but it's also this place, the universities, the libraries, all of them are financed with public money and therefore they're also public administrations. So it's of course way easier if you just approach your university and talk about the benefits of free software than just going to the parliament of course. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you can also sign our open letter as an individual of your organization or you can also convince an administration to sign the open letter but we, as I mentioned, we believe that if they, are, if they know and they're aware of the benefits that free software can bring in their digital infrastructure, then that's still something. Uh, well, this is connected to the next one, then to spread the word, to spread the word not only of our PMPC arguments, but also the benefits of free software. And again, for this, we have very nice promotion materials. You can order this online and for free with stickers, uh, leaflets, bunch of things that you can use. Um, and yeah, I mean, of course, you can donate to us. We are a charity, um, so we rely a lot on the support of the community uh, because that enables our work. And um, I personally believe that actually give us a lot of freedom to actually push for the priorities of the free software community. Um, so, yeah, I really invite you to support us 
I also had a QR code that will lead you to our support website um, in case you are interested. Um, I will wait a little bit <laughs> until some of you get it, or you can also get it here uh, in a small one. Uh, but yeah, I'm very happy if you just go to our website and check what we do. We have a lot of press releases now with the Interoperable Europe Act. There are some voting, uh, some votes coming from some of the committees that are taking care of it. So we'll be keeping you posted on how this goes. Um, and yeah, I think I, I, I hope that this gave a little bit of an overview of some of these topics. Um, and again, I would be more than happy to chat about the others uh, out there or later or by email and so on. So yeah, thank you very much and I'm very happy to take questions. One question. I am uh, uh, familiar with uh, a European environmental agency founded by European Union, and uh, they spend at least 10 million euros uh, annually for licensing at uh, Blue and S3 software for online data visualization. If you hire people for that money, a amount of money to, pro to customize open source solutions, you will get much better result because they have very bad results in this area and also you will have some code to share. So my question is, uh, uh, when you ask why they use this kind of software, you cannot get clear answer. And you can conclude that the, those millions spent by software companies lobbying in Brussels are not spent, uh, uh, they, they have good reason to spend it. And my question is, um, do you have some initiative to forbid this kind of lobbying? And I think that it is not fair uh, that your organization uh, uh, lives on donations and the software companies spend unlimited amount of money for lobbying. And, uh, and also, do you have a plan to produce some kind of directive that this uh, kind of decisions, like in this European Environmental Agency, should be more transparent and uh, use actually this open source first when you make this kind of decisions? Okay, so, um yeah, to kind of reply a little bit on this transparency and the like lobbyism happening in the in Brussels. Um, I mean, unfortunately, there is nothing we can. Um, I mean, do apart from monitoring what it's actually happening. I mean, most of the MEPs um, show or have a record of who they have met, um, and I personally also. I'm very surprised every time I reach out a policymaker and then I get a call. So I feel like, yeah, it is true that uh, there is a lot of money being allocated for these big corporations to do lobbying in, the, in Brussels, but I, at least I personally have the feeling that uh, some MEPs are very willing to also hear in the community. Um, and I feel that they actually are understanding this uh, and this is the feeling that I get by seeing the vote from yesterday and by seeing some kind of like over time how uh, the, the texts have, have changed and how this, some of these priorities from the communities have been pushed. Of course, there is, it's very far from perfect and it's very far from actually us having the power that they do have, but I feel like the doors are open and we're taking the opportunity to step in whenever we can. And I have the feeling that we've been also heard. Uh, so yeah. And regarding uh, making these agencies more transparent, and yeah, this is this is again another topic, which I actually forgot to mention. In the Interoperable Europe Act, we are also trying to push for a way 
to audit how this public money is being spent because at the moment the commission will be the ones monitoring that they're doing a good job. So what we want to do is kind of push for an external, let's say the code of auditors, to check that the public money that is spent in this interoperable solution, it's actually, you know, the money is properly or efficiently well spent. And I think this is something that it should be pushed for pretty much everything uh, or every digital policy that we're talking about, but in a, from a broader perspective, then at least from our side, there is not really much we can do the trying to push for this in very specific files. And yeah, hope that it works. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other question? Yeah, you partially answered to it uh, just, but uh, still. So, uh, at the moment, so on one of your slides, you showed that there are some uh, laws or some acts that are not legally binding, basically. Uh, and I mean, we, we already have like uh, GDPR, for example, that's still not taken seriously at all in most cases and being just either blindly ignored or. Uh, while it's really legally bidding, it can draw by, like, can, your business can sunk if you will be uh, audited properly. Uh, and uh, basically, don't you feel it's, uh, yeah, you're fighting with meal wheels or something like that, uh, with trying, yeah, to push. Because even if Ursula von der Leyen, like, you know, one, uh, one presentation, she says, Oh, well, we have a chance for uh, getting European authority in uh, IT. And then, oh, well, yeah, but we should let in uh, US-based companies, enterprises to act on our market. How it's kind of... Yeah, I mean, definitely implementation is a big problem uh, that we see with things like GDPR. Uh, but this is one of actually the main reasons why we're also trying to push for uh, indicators or things that show us progress because if we don't know how like the implication or like the implementation of these laws uh, are like how is how does it look then it is really difficult to see if they're actually effective or not and until now there is not really that much way to measure this because the text is very unclear and because there are not these performance indicator, so to say. So again, coming back specifically to the Interoperable Euro Pact, if we somehow manage to ask them in the agenda to set up a f an indicator that we can actually measure what's happening, then slowly at least we can you know, monitor and request that it's better implemented or that it's more efficiently implemented. Yeah, I mean, this is why we still have this kind of wording, when it makes sense, when there are good reasons to do so, and I don't know, I, I mean, I think we're a little bit far from like actually changing that completely, but uh, I, I, I like to remain positive. I think that step by step this will uh, be, you know, changed and the wording and the text will become more clear and therefore less ambiguous and yeah, but I mean definitely it's something that will take us some more years. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, I think we're done. <laughs> Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to take uh, more questions outside. <laughs>